In an introduction to Ken Russell's film on Tchaikovsky and the Music Lovers, for part of his BBC2 movie drone series, filmmaker and critic Alex Cox inferred that Russell's approach to classical music in cinema and television was a refreshingly anti-intellectual representation of his subjects. He claimed that Russell's intent with these films was to take classical music out of the elitist, pretentious and intellectual circles and open it up to a wider audience. I think that Alex Cox's observations, coupled with the variety of cinematic techniques and narrative angles that Russell tailors to each individual work, is a good explanation of the power behind them. The Music Lovers was Russell's first cinematic composer biopic. He managed to get the film greenlit due to the combination of Women in Love being such a hit, and his ability to sell the film to his producers as the story of a repressed homosexual who marries an infomaniac. Richard Chamberlain and Glenda Jackson play these roles respectively. The Music Lovers is a turbulent film, with some wild and vivid scenes of music and imagery entwined, as well as some truly traumatic and disturbing scenes that nearly rival the intensity of the devils at times. It evocatively explores the concept of an artist's dreams versus their reality, and on the flip side of that, the dreams versus the reality of the various admirers and lovers of the artist and his work. Between Baxter and Gomez's books on Russell, there is some interesting insight into the techniques employed within the music lovers to achieve the fantastic juxtaposition of this fantasy worldview versus the reality. Russell comments that he uses his background in shooting television commercials and his utter detest for the fake and entirely messed up world of advertising to his advantage here. The initial daydreams the various people have during Tchaikovsky's piano recital scene near the beginning of the film are all lit like glamorous commercials, bright, breezy, pretty and perfect. When the daydreams end, the lighting is much more naturalistic and the emotions more confused as one by one everyone is quickly faded back into their uncertain realities. They're in danger of falling apart, my boy, and your music shows it. It's the best thing I have ever written. I will not change one single note! Russell would also famously go on to satirise the gross world of advertising further in Tommy, as Anne Marguerite erotically rives around in soap suds, baked beans and chocolate that burst forth from her smashed television. Seeing this I read as a moment of brilliantly gross excess as the pretty illusion of what's on the TV screen is literally shattered in front of her, but she loves the gross reality anyway as she's already bought the lie. The reality versus the fantasy is explored in much more grounded psychological and emotional terms as the music lovers progresses. One of the film's strongest and most intense scenes involves the drunk newlyweds taking a night train through Russia. Nina starts to take off all her clothes and attempts to seduce Tchaikovsky into finally consummating their marriage. It doesn't quite go to plan though as Tchaikovsky seems horrified by the prospect of this and crawls up into the highest corner of the carriage. Nina subsequently passes out on the floor in the cramped carriage and her naked body rocking back and forth is filmed from the same high corner in a way that shows Tchaikovsky's repulsion at the sight of this naked flesh as if it were a slab of meat rotting before his eyes. The fact that this film can be described on the dual levels as both a composer biopic and a story of a nymphomaniac who marries a homosexual is rather central to the way that Russell approaches a lot of his biopics. In his book Fire Over England, Russell talks about his composer subjects, stating, Bartok was nocturnal, mysterious, violent and expressionistic. Debussy was dreamy, impressionistic and ambiguous. Delius was obsessive, claustrophobic, hedonistic and monochromatic. This is why Russell's composer pictures vary wildly in tone and style as he tries to capture best the spirit of each composer. This quite often means that even the whole genre will change from film to film in order to achieve the best result. Russell went on to talk about his 1970 BBC composer biopic Dance of the Seven Veils, stating that Richard Strauss had an inflated sense of his own importance and how such an ego was ripe for popping, so using his own words and music as weapons I obliged. The 1970 Strauss picture is overtly satirical and referred to as a comic strip of seven episodes. It features an over-the-top caricaturist portrayal of Strauss becoming more and more of a Nazi with every layer or veil that is peeled back with each section of the film. It was aired only once and caused so much outrage from the Strauss family at the time that they withdrew musical rights to the film, which effectively got it banned for 50 years. Russell was booted out the door of the BBC shortly after. Russell's 1968 portrait of Delius in A Song of Summer, on the other hand, is more serious, sombre and reflective. It's seen by many to be amongst his greatest works, and Russell himself once said that he wouldn't change a single thing about it. Just as The Music Lovers had its narrative layers, Song of Summer is also just as much about Eric Fenby, a promising young composer in his own right, who was broken down by a frail, paralysed, blind and bitter old man to whom he gave several years of his life towards helping achieve the composition of his final symphonies. 
The film is an utterly magnificent work, and the real Eric Fenby was even reduced to tears upon witnessing the filming of a scene due to how vividly it brought back his memories of that day. Max Adrian is great in all the smaller parts of the films that Russell had cast him in, but playing Delius here in Song of Summer is easily his finest performance for me. Where's the sun? There's a bit of cloud in the way. But you said it was coming. I don't feel it yet. There'll be a break in the cloud soon. When? When? Uh, about a minute. Eric Fenby and Richard Strauss are both played by Christopher Gable, another excellent recurring actor in the work of Russell. I had no idea that Fenby and Strauss were played by the same actor until recently. It could partly be chalked up to the bad quality of the Seven Veils print that I watched, but I would say that ultimately it's the mark of a very fine and dynamic actor to pull off two such remarkably varied roles as these two people. Similarly, 1974's Marla is just as much a film about Gustav's wife Alma Marla, played fantastically by the late Georgina Hale, who is also a promising composer in her own right, but forced to live in the shadow of her husband's success. Marla is also arguably the best all-round encapsulation of all of Russell's tonal approaches to the composer biopic. It's told as a train journey with an episodic selection of memories and dreams, which range from scenes that are sombre and reflective, to fiery and bombastic, to surreal, to wonderfully satirical and outlandish. Russell, of course, wanted these composer films to appeal to the average cineast who knew nothing about classical music just as much as he wanted to appeal to the classical aficionado who knew little of the joys of virtuistic cinema. This goes for his television work just as much as the cinema. His concern was that he had a very specific window of time at the start of his film on Debussy in order to grab the average person's attention with no interest on the subject before they get out of their chair and switch the channel. This is why 1965's The Debussy Film, in particular, features a scene very early on with an attractive modern-looking lady taking several arrows to the chest on a crucifix, whilst a euphoric expression comes across her face. The Debussy Film was Russell's most experimental approach to pushing the boundaries of what could be achieved in a televised arty biopic at the time. His composer films had to evolve steadily through his time at the BBC, before he ever got to the point of making his first true biopic with actors in Song of Summer. Voiceover narration to stock footage of old photos was the norm for deceased subjects in BBC documentaries at the time. Any artistic deviation from this in representation of the subject was deemed as being potentially deceptive to the audience. As such, his documentary on Prokofiev, Portrait of a Soviet Composer, fits the mould by and large. Russell had to change and challenge this perception of documentary at every turn. Prokofiev marked the start of this process by using a close-up of an actor's hands at a piano and conducting to an actor's distorted reflection in a muddy pond to represent the contemplative nature of the composer's music. In 1962's Elgar, he made his biggest leap in being able to allow to use different actors to portray Elgar at different stages of his life, under the proviso that the actors were filmed in longshot and did not speak any dialogue. Bartok followed this in 1964, which allowed for close-ups, but they were still not allowed to speak. Bartok is still frustratingly unavailable to watch anywhere, thus I have not yet seen it myself, save for this scene of his second piano concerto in the Russell at Work documentary. His use of intercutting stock footage works wonderfully well here for the aforementioned dark and mysterious mood of Bartok's music and persona. The intercutting here prefigures the utterly sublime aforementioned scene of Tchaikovsky's piano recital in The Music Lovers. His way of subverting the role of his subjects not being allowed to speak in the Debussy film though was to get meta. Oliver Reed plays an actor who is playing Debussy in the titular film of the title. This allowed Russell a lot more freedom in how he could grab the viewer's attention from the get-go and allowed him to take modern liberties with the excuse that it was contextualised as an invention of the film crew in the film within the film. 
Whilst Russell already made one monitor short on a contemporary composer with his very seldom seen first composer picture Gordon Jacob from 1959, 1964's Don't Shoot the Composer holds a distinction for being the only composer film of his to be about a contemporary composer that he also worked with for his own feature films. George Delarue is the composer on Spotlight here, and the film further develops Russell's approach to subverting the documentary expectations and takes full advantage of its composer's subject being contemporary and very much alive. Russell captures his personality and blends it into the subject matter and makes Delarue a collaborator in this work. He constructs sequences out of a noirish opening where Russell and his team track down the composer in France, a collection of slapstick happenstances resulting from the setting up an interview with the composer, and finally a scene which accompanies and incorporates his family life. These are interspersed throughout the film and subsequently revisited as the film reverts back to documentary mode and Delarue is seen constructing and composing the music that we have just heard for the sequences that we have just witnessed. The composer states that he loves to finish his compositions with the domesticity and comfort of his family life happening around him. Russell interprets and incorporates this beautifully into a sequence that cuts between a scene shot in the woods where the Delarue family are having fun chasing each other about, to a Delarue conducting an orchestra and playing piano for the music he's written for the scene whilst his wife and daughter watch him work. Russell takes this one step further though and lingers on the shot of the daughter's face as she starts to get bored, before storming up, slamming her hands on the piano and playing some new notes to change the tone. It's a charming and beautifully constructed sequence which displays Russell's creative impulses in full swing. Delarue composed some great scores for French dressing and women in love, but the choices of contemporary composers that Russell would use for his other non-composer films are even more fantastic and varied. Peter Maxwell Davies provides the perfect ominous avant-garde accompaniment to match the visual tone and apocalyptic feeling of the devils. John Corgliano's score for Altered State is amongst my favourite albums. It's such a dazzling and dense cacophony of aura arrangements, ripe for having a horrific drug trip to. <laughs> Carl Davis will provide a much more classical scoring for The Rainbow, which is very fitting for its turn of the century setting, whilst Thomas Dolby's schizophrenic mixture of classical tinged electronic sampling and scoring for Gothic is at odds of its Victorian setting, but simultaneously helps to cement the film's portrayal of drug addled man this rather well. The Lair of the White Worm has some nice synth work too, coupled with an irresistible folk punk song that a band plays live. John Dumpton went a fishing once, a fishing in the weir. He caught a fish up on his hook, he thought, look mighty queer. Now what the kind of fish it was, John Dumpton couldn't tell. But he didn't like the look of it, so he threw it down a well. And then there's also prog rocker Rick Wakeman, who would work on both the rock simp scoring for Crimes of Passion, as well as Russell's wildest composer biopic, Listomania. Well, I thought you were familiar with etiquette. Listomania asks if the Beatles could be immortalised on the big screen with groupies chasing them around in one film, whilst they become the centre of a fanciful plot in another, then why can't a popular composer like Franz Liszt have the same treatment for a film? The composer pictures have always tapped into the essence of what the composer was about, and Russell sees Liszt as the first true pop star, so in that respect it seemed fitting to give him the pop movie treatment. So that's exactly what happens in Listomania, a film that got mauled by the critics and branded Russell's most ludicrous and ridiculous work yet. With many bizarre set pieces including screaming groupies and a scene where Liszt's inflated ego is represented by him growing a 10 foot member that a bunch of chorus girls ride and dance around like a maypole. Yeah, the critics were right to call this the most ridiculous Ken Russell film yet, but I don't think he ever intended it not to be. 
Mania should be celebrated as an astounding feat of mainstream studio filmmaking. The fact is nothing short of mind-boggling that Russell got Warner, a major mainstream film company, to sign off on a smutty musical horror fantasy sex farce extravaganza starring Roger Daltrey as an oversexed 19th century composer in a story that features vampirism, Nazis, massacres, spaceships, voodoo magic and Ringo Starr as the Pope. Sod the naysayers, this one's a classic. I know it sounds improbable, Your Holiness, but I... What truth is stranger than fiction? We've kept going for 2,000 years on that one. <laughs> Whilst Listomania may have been his final cinematic feature based upon a composer, Russell would go on to make classical music a primary focus of his later television work. He made three more dramatised portraits of composers in the 90s that used their titles to flesh out the themes approached within them. Brahms' music comes from the brain, Wagner's comes from his balls, mine, mine comes from God, and he's rather unfashionable these days. 227, huh? The strange affliction of Anton Bruckner focuses on the composer's obsessive compulsive tendencies revolving around the significance of numeric patterns and how that influences his work. Why aren't you counting? To count would be to diminish his glory. Planets, stars, galaxies, moving in an endless song of praise. The Secret Life of Arnold Bax is a much subtler psychological portrait, with Russell himself playing the composer alongside Glenda Jackson in her final screen role before moving into politics. Special delivery from HMV, what did you think? Whereas 1992's The Mystery of Dr. Martin Yu is much more vividly surreal and features some of Russell's wildest imagery of the decade for sure. Whilst the Bruckner and Bax films were made for ITV's The South Bank Show, Martin Yu marked the first composer biopic for the BBC in 22 years, following the outrage caused by his aforementioned Dance of the Seven Veils. <laughs> Gustav Holtz's The Planets are the focus of Russell's first South Bank Show film from 1983. Each of the symphonies comes alive with a diverse array of carefully curated and edited stock footage to complement the themes of the music in fresh and interesting ways. The following year, Russell delivered the more documentary focus, but no less formally creative, Ralph Vaughan Williams' A Symphonic Portrait. Just as his Isadora film used the device of a newsreel segment to get all the biographical details into the audience's head in the first two minutes, Russell tells us all about Ralph Vaughan Williams via a scene of him reading a book about his life to his young daughter. The film then becomes something of a mixture of traditional documentary techniques with faux behind-the-scenes sequences to creatively get more exposition in, alongside some great visuals to complement the sections of the symphonies. Russell would deliver two more music documentaries in the 90s with Classic Widows, focusing on the widows of four British composers, and In Search of the English Folk Song, commissioned for Channel 4. I can't comment on the former due to its unavailability, but the latter takes the form of a documentary road trip for Russell and his pet dog Nipper, as they travel around the UK to meet the likes of Donovan and a variety of other bands and artists for a series of impromptu musical performances to find out what defines the English folk song. Nineteen eighty-eight, though, would see his greatest musical documentary work with the utterly magnificent Ken Russell's ABC of British Music. It's a truly irreverent and thoroughly charming journey through Britain's musical heritage, both the classical and popular varieties. The celebratory clash of classicism and modern pop culture is thrust from the get-go in a glorious mashup of the Beatles and Benjamin Britten. You could tell that Russell poured a lot of his enthusiasm into this work, with the sheer creativity of the format and the charisma prevalent in his presence as the host that oozes fun and wit throughout. This one's crying out for a nice quality release, as the YouTube upload is only just about watchable due to the tape generation loss. Still, it's great to be able to see it at all. Heavy metals forever! Eight bangers, turn up your ear and eight! I don't claim that I am psychic, but one look at you and I kick away every scruple. 
Considering the preoccupations with music as a theme and central focus for most of Russell's work, it's surprising that the director only ever made one full-blown musical feature offering, with 1971's The Boyfriend, starring Twiggy as a lovably shy understudy at a small theatre company. The film was made right after completion of The Devils, and features a large amount of the cast, including Murray Melvin, Max Adrian and Georgina Hale. Even Peter Maxwell Davies returned to compose the musical arrangements to the suites. The Boyfriend is one of Russell's most dazzling films. The large-scale, dreamy, bubsy Berkeley homages and the various fancy interpretations of the show's musical numbers are a very fun expansion of the same motif that was explored in The Music Lovers. These scenes are so imaginative and charming that it is impossible not to leave this one smiling. <laughs> On that note, thanks for watching again. If you enjoyed this video then please do give a thumbs up and let me know what your favourite Ken Russell films are in the comment section below. In the final video of this series I'll be exploring how the British film industry turned their back on Russell in the 80s and the impact that that had on the rest of Russell's 90s commissions and the lessons that can be learnt from the director's less successful works. I will explore the newfound liberation that Russell discovered through the ultra low budget guerrilla filmmaking of his noughties Gorsewood productions and the creative determination of that work which is so inspiring. And lastly, I'll look at Russell's contemporaries and how his generation of boundary-pushing filmmakers has influenced some of today's most interesting auteurs. So please hit that subscribe button so you can be alerted when that drops.